indicating that um, just wanted to reiterate that I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, but what I do have, I give to you, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. So all of my grade school students know that what the gospel is, is that is God revealing himself to us. And I ask them, well, what does that mean? And he says, well, it, it means that he's showing us how to love. And I want us to gaze into reality and that the reality is, is that God actually came into the world and revealed himself to us. So a lot of times we, we do have this disposition where I ask people, you know, do you believe in a God that is loving, a God that is personal, a God that is forgiving, a God that is merciful, a God that is just? And if you answered yes to any of those, then I always ask them, well, why? Why do you believe in a God like that? Because in a, in, a, in a technical way, if we just use our reason, we can't come to any of those conclusions. So if we have a clear functioning reason, a lack of emotional impediment, and a lot of time on our hands, we're going to reason to four things. Number one, God exists. Number two, God is intelligent. Number three, God is powerful. And number four, we're not God. Those are the only things that we can come to by our pure reason, but we can come to those and it's rational to believe in those four things. So, but God actually did come into the world and he revealed himself to us in Jesus Christ par excellence. Yes, the prophets, yes, the kings, the fathers, uh, but par excellence in his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And he, he revealed himself and he was showing us who we are, his sons and daughters, and what life is about. And life is about love, and love is about laying down your life uh, in your sacrifice and in your giving. So, um, you know, let's direct our gaze to what God has revealed, and that's going to bring a fullness to our understanding um, as much as we can in our humanity. It's also important to realize that God is an infinite intellect and we have a finite intellect. So if there are things that we can't quite wrap our mind around, that is to say comprehend, then that's understandable because God has an infinite intellect and ours is only finite. As we kind of move on, I want to just say I'm sorry. And when I'm saying that is I'm speaking for all the people that tried to comfort you in your difficulty, but failed. And I always try when I have a group, especially with our young people, in particular, the high school students or, or really our daily mass crew, I try and remind them that if somebody is suffering because of the death of a loved one, that you, you don't need to try and uh, to, to try and fix things because you can't. And a lot of times they'll say things that they think are comforting, but are really hurtful. And the, the most beautiful thing that people could say is just, um, I love you. I love your loved one. And then embrace you. But they don't need to try and say anything more because there's no words that are going to take away that pain. And so for those who tried to do that and might have brought more hurt, I'm asking uh, their forgiveness, our forgiveness, you know, for that hurt towards you. It is imperative that we understand that there is more to life than this world. Let me say that again. There is more to life than this world. The fourth or a fifth question of the catechism of the Catholic Church, the old Baltimore catechism said, why did God create us? And the answer is God created us to know him, to love him, to serve him, and to be with him forever in the next life. And so again, it brings us back to our whole purpose of being created is that God has created us for himself and uh, that we are meant to be in union with God and with the others in heaven 
for all eternity. So I remember when I first learned about the church's teaching on the beatific vision, and it just kind of sounded rather boring to me, where we would sit there and look at God and, uh, and, and a gaze upon his face. And it didn't make sense to me in my youth, but as I kind of grew and then went through late adolescence and then early adulthood and the first the experience of really being in love with somebody, then I, I understood it a little bit better. Because in those instances, when you're in love, it's one of the beautiful, most beautiful moments is to gaze into the eyes of those who love you. And you love them, and you're gazing into their eyes, and you see their love for you, and they see your love for them. And for that moment, I mean, it's just the world stops, and there's that deep connection. And so uh, heaven, in, in a words that we can describe, the beatific vision is being in, in union with God, with love itself. And then also that's the primary joy of heaven. The secondary joy of heaven is being in union, having that type of, of connection with the others that are in heaven. And so, you know, there's kind of eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it been conceived in the mind of a human being what God has ready for those who love him. So we use these words to try and grasp or direct our gaze, but it's important overall as we begin that we focus that this, there is a, a certain reasonable foundation here, but that it goes beyond reason consistent with it in the supernatural. Uh, you know, in faith, in hope, and charity, in the revelation of Jesus Christ, that God actually revealed this 2,000 years ago in his son. So obviously our initial response would be when we experience the death of a child is, you know, Lord, what are you doing? You know, maybe some people did not experience that, but many people, perhaps most, do turn to the Lord and say, you know, why, why did you take my child? And uh, there's all kinds of really vehement feelings. And it's important for us to know that when we pray, the, first, the best part, the best prayer is the prayer that you reflect on what is really the core feeling in your heart. And then you share that with God. And you have a conversation about that. Now, it is important to acknowledge that it's, it's, we can't just stay on the periphery. So, you know, um, how do you feel? I feel angry. Okay. Well, what does angry feel like? Well, it feels like I'm stressed. Okay. Well, what does stressed feel like? It feels like I got a lot on my plate. Well, what does that feel like? Well, I don't know. Well, stop and try and think of, put words into your feelings. Try and describe them. What, it, what are you feeling? Or what does it mean to feel a lot on, is on your plate? Okay. Um, it feels like pressure. Okay. What does pressure feel like? And then you're, then all of a sudden you, you get to the core feeling. Well, it, it feels like um, I'm powerless. Okay, that's a core feeling. Another core feeling is I feel alone. Another core feeling is I feel unloved. Another core feeling is I feel inadequate. Okay, the, these are all you know, core, core feelings. And when you know when you get to one because you put your finger on it, and there, there is almost like a, a deflating of a balloon where at least, at least now you're being honest with yourself and you're about ready to be honest with God and say, well, this is what I feel. I feel completely powerless. This is where I'm at. And you have this conversation that's authentic and real, and then it's time to listen. And if we, we do that, then, then he's going to speak to us. Again, there's more to life than this world. About eight years ago, 
I came to a situation where this couple had a pregnancy where it was very clear it was an encephalic child and he was not going to make it. They doctors encouraged the couple to get a therapeutic abortion. And their response was, well, we don't think that that's very therapeutic for our child. And so they made all kinds of provisions. Uh, they traveled to different hospitals and they were able to keep the pregnancy until about eight months. And then at eight months, they were no longer able to uh, continue. And so she gave birth and they held the child and were able to baptize the child and just just had those those particular moments. And they they named him Donovan. And uh, and Donovan uh, in in Gaelic means fighter. And it was a, a moment where I, I looked at them and I thought, you know, how beautiful this was that that they um, did everything that they could for their child, even though the child wasn't even born. And at the funeral homily, I really encouraged them to direct again the gaze of the revelation of Jesus Christ to, to direct their, their focus on the fact that we um, look forward to the resurrection. And this is what God revealed, that, that heaven ultimately and eventually will be a bodily experience and an experience where we're never quite ourselves as human beings uh, unless we're in the body. And, and so there's a pining. They can be in heaven, but they're looking forward to the resurrection again, and we're all going to be there. And so it's, a, you know, it's this, this pining again for the ultimate resurrection and to be with God. Um, as a human being in the body. So some of the theologians in particular, St. Thomas Aquinas, maybe the greatest theologian that ever lived, he said, you know, well, what, are, what are we going to look like in heaven in our bodies? He, he purported that we would be 33. So, and I think he was related to, and he was saying that that relates to the fact that Jesus died at 33, and there was some other things that he gave there. I personally am hoping for 24. OK, I was uh, looking a little better at 24 than 33. But, you know, th the reality is, is that we are going to have Donovan was an encephal encephalic child there. His glorified body will be perfected. Uh, he couldn't talk as a baby, but he'll be able to talk in the re resurrection. Uh, th th there will be this this ability to communicate and. I told them during the funeral homily that there will be a moment when they die and Donovan, run, John, Donovan runs up to them and, and he says, dad, dad, it's me, it's Donovan. And they're going to embrace him and they're gonna say, well, I, I was thinking of it, you at this time. And he goes, I know, I know I was there. I was praying for you, God gave me the, the privilege to be an intercessor in that moment. And I was there with you. You know, mom, it's me, it's Donovan. It's the same thing. I, I was there, mom. I was there during all of those experiences. And God gave me that gift to pray for you. So I know that there, there can be some questions, you know, about the different ways that our, the children pass. Uh, one of them is suicide and what the church teaches in that regard. So it, it's important for us to understand that, you know, the moral act has three different parts. One, grave matter. The other is, do we know that it's grave? And then the, the last one, very significant, is that we do have to have full possession of our will in order to separate ourselves from God. And in the particular instance of a suicide, yes, it's grave to take one's own life. Yes, they probably knew that. But the reality is, and this is what, what rational psychology is teaching us, is that they, they don't have full possession of their will. And that's consistent with the church's theology as well um, in a number of different facets. So 
uh, the act of committing suicide is 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 not a is not an act that will separate them from God. Okay, that's an, an important thing. Again, the act of suicide is not an act that will separate our child from God. To tell you that I understand um, is really more a, a to tell you that I, I can only imagine that your hearts are restless. So St. Augustine, and it's probably the most quoted line outside of scripture, said that our hearts are restless, Lord, until they rest in thee. And this is extremely important for us to focus on because your child's heart is no longer restless. Let me say that again. Your child's heart is no longer restless. Your heart is restless, but your child's heart is no longer restless. Now, there might be a difficulty in saying, well, you know, I, I want my heart to, to be rest uh, without, um, I want my heart to be at peace as well. I want my heart to be at rest. And so I just, I don't have a purpose anymore. I just want to move on. I just want to die. I just want to go and be with my child. And the difficulty there is that uh, you are missing out on the invitation that God is giving you to love your child more. So in other words, every single day that we live, we have, a, we have choices that we can choose and we can either choose to love and to increase our capacity to love, or we can choose something else and we decrease our capacity to love. And you might ask, well, what's the significance there? The significance is that the, the capacity to love that we cultivate in this life will be directly proportional to the way in which we love in heaven. So let me explain it this way. Somebody, and this is where God's justice and his mercy come into play and they come together. So let's say an individual squanders his whole life. And maybe you even thought that, you know, my child was so, so such a good person. And then you look over and you see this this person who's squandering their life or being so thoughtless or hating you know, it's like, why do they have life and my child doesn't, you know, the person can go their whole life, 80 years, they squandered everything. And the very end, they repent and they go to confession, they receive um, absolution, they receive the last rites, and then they die. And then they'll go through purgatory, which is a time where we, we kind of reread our life and look at all of our different mistakes and um, our prayers help them to, to kind of walk through that rereading. And once we've kind of reread through the fullness of, of our own mistakes, then we're ready to enter the fullness of God's embrace. So that person will stay in purgatory for a long time. Let's say Mother Teresa, who loved her whole life, now is, and she passes, but she wasn't perfect. And uh, but she might spend just a brief time in purgatory and now she's in heaven. So she's in heaven along with the person who squandered their life. So you're saying, well, where's the justice in that? Well, that's not God's justice. That's his mercy. So uh, the mercy is that they both are now in heaven. His justice comes in this way that. Mother Teresa and the person who squandered their life do not experience heaven the same way. Mother Teresa, because she's or she has cultivated a capacity to love like an ocean, um, experiences God's embrace and God's gaze in, in his eyes. And also, and there's the key, also the way in which she is able to experience the love of everybody in heaven including her parents and, and you know, her friends, whatever. 
So now she is able to love in a greater way because she's cultivated this capacity to love. The person who squandered their life, their capacity is like a little thimble, okay? And that's what they, that is their, their way in which they embrace God and embrace everybody in heaven. They're still in heaven because they repented, okay? So that's, there's a mercy there. That's God's mercy. God's justice is meted out through all eternity because of the cap capacity to love that we choose. So if God's giving you one more day, he's giving you one more day to love your child more in heaven for all eternity. The greater your capacity to love, the greater that you will be able to love God and everyone else in heaven. It's also important and it's, it's helpful from rational psychology that, that we're, we're hearing more and more of a response to those people who say, well, you just gotta let go and you just gotta move on. And what we're finding in, in certainly we know that in our heart that that doesn't, it's inconsistent, you know, with what we're feeling and what we're experiencing. But also we're, we're seeing that in the, the rational psychology literature as well, where they understand that just letting go and moving on is, is not really consistent with our human experience. So what, the, what we're using now more clearly is, is a reframing and a rebuilding of our, our meaning in this life. So in other words, our, our children were center stage in our, our frame of meaning. And so now physically they're no longer with us, but now they've moved on to the next life and now they're interceding for us. Sometimes if we open ourselves and God allows that we can feel their presence in an intense way, nevertheless, they're there, they're, um, in, they're interceding. And, um, and so we, our frame of meaning has to fit that in it, that, that they have moved on and that, that they are now praying for us and we're praying for them. God's allowing them sometimes to be, you know, profoundly present to us. And that's, that's a sense of meaning that, that we have to build. And when I say build, it's, it's not like a mental gymnastic as much as it is a meditation to focus on that reality. Part of that is, is understanding the gift of faith that we have within us. So the gift of faith we receive in baptism, it can also come to us outside of the sacraments, but fundamentally God works through the sacraments. And the gift of faith is not, oh, I don't understand it. Um, so I just guess I'll take it on faith. That's not the faith that the church teaches. So we have the natural light of reason that enables us to see. And I understand whether that's material or immaterial. What's the square root of 49? Seven. Okay, well, how do I know that? I know that through the natural light of reason. Faith is a supernatural knowing. A supernatural knowing. And in other words, if you've had an encounter with the living God, then you, you know. Well, it's like, was it consistent with reason? Yes, it's consistent with reason, but it goes beyond that. And so that is the gift of faith. And that is in us, in our baptism. You might say, Father, well, I really don't experience that. And the fact is, is that you have to stir that gift of faith within you. So um, sometimes I'll tease the congregation. I did it recently. I said, is there anybody that re-gifts out there? Anybody re-gift? All right. So you get that. It would be like get, getting a gift, not even opening it, and just putting it in the closet. It, you know, that could be our faith if we, if we don't um, stir it. In other words, we have to take that gift that God has given us, unwrap it, you know, and continue to live it. And part of that is questions. You have to ask questions and not just questions and you just let them float, but questions and you seek them out to, with people that you, maybe it's a priest or a deacon or a religious sister, or maybe it's somebody that you just respect in their faith. 
and and you continue you know to ask those questions and seek out the answers and the more that you do that that's going to stir the gift of faith within you i'll give you an example that i use it's a relevant analogy if you take a, a glass of milk and you pour a whole bunch of chocolate syrup in it but you don't do anything with it it looks that the chocolate syrup is in there but but there's it's not apparent unless it's stirred and once it's stirred, then it, it's quite apparent uh, and it fills the glass. And it's the same, it is a relevant analogy for the gift of faith that is in us. Un unless, unless we're asking those questions, unless we're reaching out, unless we you know, maybe try to have a, a counseling session or a therapy session with a therapist or reach out to a priest or go to mass or go to confession, that we're then it's, it's not going to be this gift of faith that enables us to know God is not, we're not going to have a full access to it. So, you know, it, it's important for us to continue to do that, uh, to grow in our faith and our hope and our love. Hope is faith oriented towards the future. Again, faith is a supernatural knowing of God. I know this by faith oriented towards the future. I know that God will be with me no matter what. I know he's here. I know God is here. Love is to be able to love as God has loved. You know, he laid down his life for you and me. And we're called to continue to lay down our life and sacrifice. And so, you know, God gives us the grace to do that. So, so we, wanna, we want to focus on the fact that, that God has come into this world and he has revealed this to us. What I'm talking to you about, what I've mentioned today has been revealed in Christ, that, that that is reality, and that there is more to life than this world. Again, there is more to life than this world. Just kind of end with just a couple of things. Did God want my child to die? No. Is God with my child? Yes. Is my child with God? Yes. Is my child's heart restless? No. Is my child at peace? Yes. Is my heart restless? Yes. But it is this hope, the hope that I will know their embrace again that will rebuild and reframe our sense of hope and of love. Let's end with a little prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, I would ask that through your power that you would help us, whether it's in this moment or sometime today or sometime in the near future, that each parent who has had a child die, that you, would, that you would help them and you would bring their child to them and to help them to feel their presence, that you would stir the gift of faith within them, that they would know that their child is in your embrace, that their heart is no longer restless, and that you would calm the restlessness in the hearts of our parents. And I ask this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.